And what do you do with the beef cows? Well, this time of year they have to be fed very carefully. You, you call them up every day and give them hay and give them grain. And then they're having their calves now, their babies. Once in a while, one of them has to have a lot of help. Just like if a mama goes to the hospital or to a doctor to have a baby delivered, then I'm, I'm the doctor. I have to deliver the baby calf. And that's very interesting. And I hear you have some famous relatives. Me? I don't have any famous relatives. But my wife had a famous relative, uh, Daniel Boone. He settled Kentucky, and then when he got to be an old man, he moved to Missouri, to our part of the state, and he brought a good deal of his family with him. And uh, there are several thousand people in the central part of Missouri who are descended from Daniel Boone, and she is one of them. He, uh, he was quite a pioneer, and he, he brought uh, the Anglo civilization to that area. And did he um, help a lot, or um, what did he do? Well, if you were a Native American Indian in our area, I don't think you would regard him as a great deal of help, because he was essentially competing with the Indians. They uh, killed the wild animals for their skins and sold them then back east. And that's what the Indian population was doing. But if you were someone from the East looking for land, why, well, he was a big help then, because he showed them how to come and take over the land and how to farm it. Oh, and um, would you have, like, any message for these kids? You bet I have got lots of messages for kids. One thing was, it was very helpful to me to have gone to school when I was farming and the money was not very plentiful and I needed a job. I had that training from my schooling and that uh, was a very good thing to have. The other thing is a particular thing with me, Wesley. I like animals. I don't like to see anyone mistreat them. And I wish that uh, kids and grown-ups would be very kindly to their pets and to their farm animals and to the wild animals if they can. The, um, the animals are exactly like us, except we have uh, a lots of intelligence. Well, the animals have some intelligence, but they don't communicate the way that we do. You were just in South America, I understand. And where were you? Were you in Peru? Yeah, I was in Peru, um, over there. It's kind of tough for people. You know, there's these, they have like apartments and they're really close together. And where I stayed was four, four staircases up. So, um, you know, it, the first time I just ran up really <coughs> quick. And since the elevation is pretty high, my head and my breath was like, <coughs> and my head was hurting a little. So did you did you see any animal any farm animals there? Are they like our animals? There are animals over there. Um, I I didn't really see any, but um, I saw uh, this kind called a llama. Uh -huh. It's white. It looks like a camel, but it's different. It's all white. It's kind of You've got a great long neck. Yeah, kind of long yeah. neck. And then I took some pictures with it. We had a person in our part of Missouri that tried to raise them. It was an oddity, uh, kind of a hobby, and I don't know really how it came out. Another person is raising ostriches. So you don't have to raise just cows and pigs. You can raise some other different kinds of animals. Are, are there any um, endangered species that are like, dying out? Well, there are lots and lots of endangered species in all parts of the country. Most of them aren't very dramatic. It's not like you know, a lion was becoming endangered, or an elephant. A lot of them are kind of small, obscure little animals that live in the forest, and some plants. And some of our pollution, sometimes, from factories and all, can be very hard on the plants and animals. Could an oil spill um, kill a lot of animals? Yeah, that's very dramatic. Oil spill is particularly hard on the waterfowl, so I'm told. 
We don't have much of that in our area. Our main water is the Missouri River, and uh, it's kind of muddy, and there's not a, not a great lot of fish or animals in it, but some. And I have a message for these kids here, too. Everybody should take care of animals, not mistreat them <coughs> like they're a little stuffed animal. And you should go to school, too, so you could have a job and so you can have monies and so you, so you can live on with your life. Well, Wesley, we're in agreement, I think. Yeah. So today we should learn that. And that's all. So till next time, I'll see you, friends. Thank you, Mr. David Horner, for coming here. It was really nice having you. Thank you, Wesley. I enjoyed it. Okay, bye. Five, four, three, two, roll. Did you have any experiences with elephants? Me? Elephants in Missouri? No, I just of the St. Louis Zoo. I would go there and uh, ad admire them as any child might do in a big city. But I did go to school with a girl whose family had Budweiser beer, the Anheuser Busch, the Bush family. And she had an elephant in her backyard, and a per had a big backyard, and had a person that looked after the elephant. And the elephant could give rides to children. I, not, I never did do that. They looked awfully big and intimidating to me. And, um, oh, I've did you ever have any experiences with other animals? Well, for many years we had sheep. That was a standard thing on a farm in, in Missouri. And this time of year in the winter they take a lot of care when they're having their little ones. Sometimes you have a mama that has lambs and doesn't have any milk, and then you have to fix bottles for the sheep and keep the bottles warm and give them a little bit of milk every two hours the first couple of days all night long and outside it's about 20 degrees below freezing so it's a lot of fun trying to keep all those little ones uh, healthy sometimes we bring them in the house uh, to keep them warm sometimes when I found them they are already chilled and cold you can tell that because you open their mouth and put your finger on their tongue and it's, it's cold and you know they're not going to live very long that way. So you give them a little bit of warm milk. Once in a while I would give them one drop of whiskey and the alcohol would help them to warm up. That's one drop mm -hmm. and not very much. And then one time I had one that was so cold I, put it, I wrapped it up in a towel and put it in the oven. And after a while, it warmed up, and I didn't have the oven turned up very high, and I had the door open. But after a while, it warmed up, and it uh, stood up, and it was fine, but its mind wasn't very good. And when I tried to teach it to drink milk, it never really could learn. It would stick its mouth down in the milk and suck it, and then it would run out of air, and it would run backwards until it hit something and fall down. And we did that every day until it was grown. So they're a lot of fun. But anyone that has, say, a hundred sheep having lambs in the winter has got a full-time job. But the, the wool from the lambs is great for clothing. But it has a lot of competition from things like from all of the other synthetic fabrics. So I think you know, in South America and Peru, they use a lot of wool because they have, you know, cool nights so when you're living up in the high altitude. But uh, the wool hasn't been a very good price, so the sheep business hasn't been very good around here. Oh, so um, I've got a message for the kids, too. Um, always take care of animals. Don't hurt them. They're just like us, except... Um, they they don't have homes and oh they do have homes but they don't have all the stuff we have and 
Another thing is stay in school so you can get a job and so you can get on with your life. And thanks a lot, Mr. Um, David Horner, for coming here. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Wesley. I enjoyed it. Okay. Bye, friends. Cookie, and they simply do not eat uh, sweet foods, and they go everywhere on their bicycles. Do you have a bicycle? Yeah, I do. And do you go everywhere on it? Yeah. Well, over there, the streets are crowded with bicycles, and they all have little bells on them. And so, when you go out in the street, there'll be hundreds of bicycles, and they're all going. You know, tickle, 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 tickle. And it's a funny sound. Do they have cars there? The individuals just don't have cars unless they're very, very rich. And nobody's very rich. Maybe if they work. Dr. Wiener Fred Horner, have, how many books have you written? I've written about eight books. It's a lot, isn't it? Yes. And I had a family, too. You did? How, how big was your family? I had four children. In the first book I wrote, I uh, remember I used to write standing up because if I sat down, the children wanted me to read to them. And I like to read to them, but their idea of a sitting mother was somebody who would read. And we read lots of books together. And I had uh, one favorite one was Charlotte's Web. Have you ever read Charlotte's Web? Yeah. And I always, the children laughed about that because I always cried in it. And when Charlotte died, or did the pig, Charlotte died. And uh, I remember one time when I was trying to write and the children were playing around. They were, I guess, eight and six and four and two, eight, six, about those, that age. And the two-year-old was in the playpen. Maybe he was one-year-old. And she was, he was in the playpen. And so the children were climbing up my legs and I couldn't get anything done. So finally, I took him, that was David, out of, his, of the playpen, and I got in the playpen with my typewriter, and then I finished the article I was writing. And the children had the house, and I had the playpen. And that worked really well. But uh, I wrote about the children. I mean, that was what I knew about. And so if my two-year-old was running all over the house, I would write an article about how to take care of your two-year-old. But my own two-year-old was running crazy around the house. <laughs> and so was it, fun, was it fun writing and taking care of your kids and doing everything? Yeah, it was fun. My writing, I love doing my writing. And that's one thing about reading. The more you read, the more you the better you can write. One of the best ways to learn how to write is to read a lot. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Because uh -huh. you just finally, you read so much and you, you begin to think in those words and then you can write. And I, uh, we had a storm one time when I was a little girl, a really bad storm, and my mother wanted to encourage us to write. So she 
said she would give a quarter, and that was a lot of money then when I was a little girl, she would give a quarter to whoever in the family wrote the best account of the storm. And we all worked so hard on that. And you know who got the quarter? Who? We all got it. <laughs> she had to give quarters to all of us because we all had worked so hard on it. And that was fun. When you were little, how many people were in your family? Well, I had three older brothers and uh, I was the youngest and I was a girl and I really kind of thought I was a boy. And I was always trying to, they spent the summer trying to drown me. And then they would pull me up by the hair to see if I was still alive. And if I was alive, they'd put me under the water again. So I got to be pretty tough. And I always wore their uh, outgrown clothes. So I, I grew up in shorts. And my mother had me have a boyish bob, because that was the easiest way to keep my hair when I was little. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of like a boy with my brothers, and that was fun. It was? Yeah. And made me very, very tomboyish. Yeah. So it was really fun to write, to do read, mm -hmm. really fun mm -hmm. to grow up, to start a job. Right? To get on with your... But writing is always good. I mean, writing can do all sorts of... It helps you think of things. It helps you get your experience you've had together. Like if you wrote about how you felt about this TV show, you would discover things about yourself that you hadn't known before. So sometimes...